My name is Taylor Sutton. I serve as one of the pastors here, and it's, it's my joy to open God's Word for us this morning. Before we do that, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do ask you to speak in this time that we have set aside, uh, set aside out of our morning and really out of our whole week to gather as your church and listen to your word. Give us eyes to see what we need to see. Give us hearts that are open to what you would have us become. And give us expanded capacity to take in your glory and your beauty through your word. We pray this through Jesus, who died, yet lives. Amen. Well, many have remarked that we live in a divided age. Our divided age gets described in a number of different ways. We hear words like polarization, tribalism, uh, fracturing. And what's interesting about that, at least to me, is our country has always been full of disagreements and differences. So that part is not new. What seems to be new is the intensified animosity and alienation that now accompanies our disagreements and our differences. And the question I want to put before you this morning is, what do Christians have to offer to a divided age? Now, some might hear that question and say, well, it seems like Christians often make things worse because Christians have this message that we proclaim that says everybody needs a Savior, but only Jesus is that Savior. And so the, the criticism could be that we simply intensify and escalate disagreements and differences. And maybe there are situations where that happens. But this morning I want to make the case from the book of James that when the message of Christianity is rightly understood and truly embraced, it produces a way of treating people that is both counterintuitive and deeply needed. So would you join me in turning to James chapter 2 as we continue our series in the book of James. This morning we're going to look at James 2 verses 1 through 13. James chapter 2 verses 1 to 13. This is God's word. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, receiving the mercy of Christ replaces partiality with respect and love. That is the the better way that James shows us and calls us to in this passage. Receiving the mercy of Christ replaces partiality with respect and love. This passage is comprised of a command followed by four reasons that we ought to obey the command. So that's the way we'll look at it this morning. We have a command followed by four reasons to obey the command. So let's start with the command. This is verse 1. Verse 1 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So the, the main thrust of what James is exhorting us to is do not show partiality. Now, what is partiality? Partiality is unjustly favoring one party and unjustly discriminating against another. The word that James uses here has its roots in the Old Testament, where a similar phrase was used to describe uh, making an unjust judgment based on appearances rather than based on what's really going on on. And if you think about it, partiality defined this way is something that infects all of humanity. It's not new. It's not recent. Uh, Think about the common phenomenon that many people now describe as in-group bias. This is a common form of partiality. In-group bias is where you have a favorable assumption about people in your own group, whatever that group might be, accompanied by an unfavorable assumption of members of other groups. That's partiality. Another version or expression of partiality is calibrating your treatment of a person to the amount of benefit you expect to get from them. So partiality is, in some senses, the default setting of sinful, selfish humanity. Yet, James says to Christians, this must not be the case among you. Notice in verse 1 how this command is framed. He doesn't merely say, show no partiality, period. Look at what he says. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So apparently, there is some kind of basic incompatibility between partiality and faith in Christ. James is saying favoritism and the gospel do not mix. Discrimination and the grace of Jesus do not go together. And so, however natural or common partiality may be, James establishes for Christians with this command that partiality has no place in the Christian life. Partiality has no place in the Christian life. Now, why should we obey this command? How do we know that partiality has no place in the Christian life? Well, the rest of the passage is devoted to answering those questions. We have in the rest of James 2, 1 through 13, 
four reasons for obeying this command in verse 1. Four reasons why partiality has no place in the Christian life. Let's look at reason number one. The first reason that partiality has no place in the Christian life is that it does not fit the kind of community that the church is supposed to be. Partiality does not fit the kind of community that the church is supposed to be. And we see this reason spelled out in verses 2 through 4. So in verses 2 and 3, James gives an example of partiality in action. And then he gives his assessment in verse 4. So look at the example. Verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly... And a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. So that's the picture. That's the scenario that James sketches for us. It seems to be some kind of Christian gathering, perhaps the Sunday uh, worship assembly, although he doesn't say that specifically, And into this Christian assembly comes two men, one visibly, obviously rich, and the other visibly, obviously poor. So there's no question about the economic status of each of these men. And in this scenario that James paints, uh, they are both treated very differently. So this is a textbook case of partiality. Now, What is James's assessment of that? That's what verse 4 gives us. If that were to happen, James says in verse 4, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So when a Christian community engages in partiality, they are doing at least two things, according to verse 4. They are divided among themselves, and they are making unjust judgments. And a clear implication in what James is saying is such things ought not to happen in a Christian community, in a church that is called by the name of Jesus. Uh, Many of you have read uh, George Orwell's famous book, Animal Farm. So in Animal Farm, the animals, uh, they have an uprising against the humans. They overthrow their human farmer and they take over the farm. And the stated purpose for this revolution is that they are going to establish an animal-run farm on the principles of equality. And uh, this uh, ideal or these principles of equality, they get spelled out early on in seven commandments. And these seven commandments are painted on the side of the barn. The seventh commandment is all animals are equal. And of course, as you know, if you've read it, what happens is a group of pigs uh, gradually consolidate their power. And in the end, they become tyrants every bit as domineering as the human farmer had been. But they do it while keeping up the pretense of equality. And so by the end of the book, as uh, the absurdities of the contradiction that these leaders are perpetrating against the other animals, it, it, the, the contradiction reaches its climax when the seven commandments on the side of the barn are replaced with a single commandment. It's probably the most famous line in the book. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. It it captures with a a wry humor the absurdity of what the the leaders were trying to do. It also captures a stubborn tendency of the human heart and of human communities, which is to betray your own ideals while still pretending to believe them. And James says to Christians, you must resist that tendency. 
to betray your own ideals while pretending, while making a show of believing them. Think about, think about what the church is. The church is the assembly of sinners who have been rescued by the death and resurrection of Jesus. That, that is what the church is. So nobody gets in to the church in the sense of becoming a Christian. Nobody gets in because they were rich or powerful or pretty or accomplished. The only way in is a humble embrace of the cross of Jesus Christ. So how contradictory it is for Christians to then turn around and act as if the rich and the powerful and the pretty and the accomplished are somehow worthy of deferential treatment or they're somehow better than others. Jesus did not save his people so that they could just recreate and mimic the social hierarchies of the world around us. He saved his people to create a totally different kind of community. And so James says, partiality has no place in the Christian life because it does not fit the kind of community the church is supposed to be. That's the first reason. Second reason that partiality has no place in the Christian life is that it contradicts God's own attitude towards the poor. Partiality contradicts God's own attitude towards the poor. And we see this in verse 5 and the first part of verse 6. So look at verse 5. He says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. So we have in verse 4 and verse 5 a sobering contrast. James says, look at how God treats the poor. Look at the honor and care that he extends to them, making them rich in faith, making them heirs of the kingdom. And James says, lay that next to how you are treating the poor man. God honors and cares for you, verse 6 says, dishonor, disrespect. So God has shown this tremendous grace and attention and honor to the poor. And James's readers, in some way, have failed to do the same. Now, we might ask, why? Why would they be so tempted? If they're Christians, why would they be tempted to treat the poor in a way that is so contradictory to God's own heart for the poor? Well, we could think of a number of reasons. In every society, in every age, the poor, by definition, are low in status, they have lots of needs, and they have very little ability to give any benefit to others. So in any society, in any age, it's always going to be the most comfortable thing to avoid a person in desperate poverty. You might even say it will usually be the most rational thing if you're thinking in terms of rational self-preservation to just avoid a poor person. They have nothing to offer you. They're low in status. They are a vortex of need. What, can, what good can come of that for you? But James says to the Christian, even though that's true, if our God treats the poor the way verse 5 says he does, then how can we do anything other than imitate him and show respect and honor to those whom God has shown such respect and honor? So that's the second reason. Partiality contradicts God's own attitude towards the poor. The third reason is related to the second reason. The third reason, which we see in verses 6 and 7, is that partiality values the wrong things in the rich. Partiality values the wrong things in 
the rich. Look at verse 6. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? So again, just like verses uh, 5 and 6, in the next part of verse 6 and verse 7, James uses these rhetorical questions to appeal to things that his readers already know. And what he's saying is look at the people who are opposing your faith and oppressing you, dragging you to court, taking advantage of you. Are they rich or are they poor? And the obvious answer that James expects his readers to supply is, well, they're, they're the rich. They're not the ones that are below us on the socioeconomic ladder. They're the ones that are above us. And so James is saying, why are you treating them with like special deference as if they are your benefactors somehow. Look at how they're actually treating you. Look at how they're treating the name by which you were called. Your, your conduct towards them doesn't match who they really are. Now, when we look at verses 5 through 7, it raises a question, which is, is James saying that God makes all poor people heirs of his kingdom, and that all rich people are blasphemers. It it almost sounds like that when you just read it in isolation, as if James is making absolute universal statements about the poor as poor people and the rich as rich people. I don't think that's the best way to read what James says here, to read it in an absolute or universal sense. For one thing, Jesus said that although it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, he then said all things are possible with God. And then we also have examples in some of the New Testament letters where instructions are given to rich believers. So something different is going on than just saying God saves all poor people and all rich people are not saved. So what's going on here? What is James doing? Well, one possibility that's, that's likely, I think, is that the readers, the audience that James was writing to, were, in fact, low on the socioeconomic scale. So if you imagine a congregation or a group of congregations where basically everybody is, let's say, to use a modern terminology, working class. If that's the situation of James's readers, then what he's saying essentially is, hey, Christian, look around your church. Who are the kinds of people that God has saved in your church? And they would look around and go, yeah, none of us are very impressive or wealthy or powerful. God has shown great kindness to us, a bunch of relatively poor people. And then if that is the situation where these churches were predominantly low income, low wealth, then when they look outside and and James might say, who are the people who oppose Christians and make the church's life miserable? They might say, well, it's largely the wealthy landowners that have power over us. So it could just be that it's based partly on the situation that they're in, and that may be the case. We can't know for certain what the social location was of these Christians. But one thing that we do know for certain is that all of Scripture testifies to the fact that God does take a particular delight in exalting the lowly and humbling the high and mighty. That is across the Old Testament and the New Testament. God takes a particular delight in exalting the lowly and humbling the high and the mighty. And so what James is saying here is if that is true, then Christians ought not to be deceived by the impressive veneer of wealth, power, and status. We ought to be able to value the things that matter, matter most. Uh, this is kind of a silly example, but think about how so many celebrity endorsements work. Like some celebrity endorsements, in my humble opinion, 
uh, don't make sense. Some of them do, right? Like if a professional athlete is endorsing like an athletic shoe, there's some, there's some like expertise there. Like that's a credible recommendation, even if it's a paid recommendation. But other endorsements, like a professional athlete endorsing a credit card or a professional athlete endorsing uh, like a fast food chain. Like I'm pretty sure there are like better experts that could speak to those subject areas when it comes to credit cards or fast food restaurants or like what watch you should buy. But what the advertisers are counting on is that our admiration for excellence in one area will just overwhelm all other considerations. And James is saying to us as Christians, when you consider the powerful and the wealthy and the high in status, there is something impressive about that. There is a kind of excellence there that is real, but that shouldn't blind us from seeing what what really matters. Christians should be able to see through wealth, power, and status to what is of ultimate importance, which is a person's relationship with God and their treatment of other people. So that's the third reason that partiality has no place in the Christian life. It values the wrong things in the rich. Let's consider now the fourth reason. The fourth reason that partiality has no place in the Christian life is that it violates God's command to love our neighbors. Partiality violates God's command to love our neighbors. This is in verses 8 through 13. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me again. Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But, verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So there's a, there's a contrast here. Following the royal law that is in accordance with the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, or showing partiality. And in some ways, that's a little surprising because when you think about, if you were to ask yourself, what's the opposite of partiality? The first thing that comes to my mind is justice or fairness. That's the opposite of partiality, which is true. But James is emphasizing that also opposed to partiality is simply Love. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Think about how you would want to be treated if you entered a situation where you were the the lowest person on the social hierarchy or you entered a situation where you were clearly the odd person out. Would you want to be ignored or dismissed or disrespected or belittled? No. So James says, If that's not how you want to be treated, then don't treat other people that way. Loving your neighbor as yourself demands, among other things, not showing partiality. And I think one of the insights this gives us is that at the root of partiality is selfishness. At the root of partiality is selfishness. Because what partiality says is that my well-being is more important than anyone else's. And, And I think the surprising implication of that is when you are committing partiality, when you're showing favoritism, even the kindness that you show to the favored party is selfish. Because kindness inconsistently applied demonstrates that you're only deploying kindness when it benefits you. It's a bit like the difference between philanthropy and bribery. Philanthropy is giving money to benefit a cause or an organization. Bribery is giving money to get a benefit in return. And just as bribery can disguise itself as philanthropy, like I'll give a gift to this university so my 
kid can get in. Just as bribery can disguise itself as philanthropy, selfishness can disguise itself as kindness when it is deployed with partiality. So I think it's important for us to make an honest assessment of where we are guilty of partiality and where perhaps we are tempted to show partiality. Ask yourself, who are the low-status people that you are tempted to ignore? And ask yourself, who are the high-status people that you are tempted to use? So maybe some of you students are ignoring the socially awkward classmate who no one wants to talk to while trying to impress the popular classmate who could advance your social standing. Maybe some of you are treating with harshness and impatience the people who work for you while being endlessly patient with your biggest clients. Maybe some of you are just consistently mean to members of your family while being consistently gracious to your friends. Maybe some of you are quick to demonize people with whom you disagree while steadfastly defending people in your own ideological tribe. What this passage is showing us is these kinds of patterns, they're not just wrong. If the gospel is true, they don't make any sense. Look at verses 12 and 13. In verses 10 and 11, James explains how committing one act of transgression is transgression no matter which law you're breaking. And then he closes this section in verses 12 and 13 like this. He says in verse 12, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So as Christians, why do we fight our own tendencies to partiality? Well, James closes here with two things. We, we fight partiality, first of all, because we know that we will give an account to an impartial judge one day. We know that there is a God who stands above the richest and most powerful humans that have ever lived, and we will answer to him one day. He will weigh our treatment of the lowly and the exalted. And on that day, it will not be the case that our good works will save us. Rather, it will be the case that our good works will serve as necessary evidence that we have, in fact, trusted in Jesus Christ. So we conduct ourselves, not trying to justify ourselves, but soberly aware of the fact that we will give an account to our Creator. We also fight partiality as Christians by remembering the mercy that God has shown to us. Look at verse 13 one more time. He says, judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. To be a Christian, by definition, is to have set your hope on the mercy of God in Christ. And mercy just means God's saving compassion. That God looked at our mess and had compassion that moved him to rescue us. So as Christians, by definition, we're counting on that. 
We're counting on the mercy of God in Christ. How can people counting on that mercy turn around and withhold mercy from certain people? James says they cannot. If a person consistently withholds mercy, verse 13 is saying, they reveal themselves to be not a Christian. And that sobering reality also gives us a a very positive implication. The implication of that in verse 13 is that if you are a Christian and you want to grow in resisting partiality, in showing genuine respect and love, one of the best ways you can do that is to lean in to God's mercy. Because the more, the more alive you are to your own desperately poor condition before a rich and holy God, the less inclined you will be to look down on or dismiss or disrespect someone who appears to be beneath you. And in the same way, the more alive you are to the abundantly generous mercy that God has poured out on you, the less inclined you will be to try to use people who are above you. Receiving the mercy of Christ replaces, not all at once, but over a lifetime of faith and repentance, receiving the mercy of Christ replaces partiality with respect and love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that just like the original recipients of this letter, we have failed in this. We have betrayed our own gospel ideals while still giving lip service to them. We have shown partiality. We have played favorites. We have discriminated against some while favoring others. And we have done so unjustly and selfishly. And we do ask, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us for our sin. And we pray that as part of your mercy on us, you would transform us by your grace in Jesus, to be less and less partial, less and less unjust in our dealings, less and less discriminatory in the way we treat people, less and less calculating and selfish in our interactions. God, we believe that this is your desire, this is your purpose in saving us, in restoring us. And so we pray with confidence, Lord, please continue that work in this place, in us as a people. May we be a community that is noticeably different for our lack of partiality and for the vibrant presence of love, of respect, and dignity. God, we pray for your help, and we rejoice, and we put all of our confidence in your mercy. Amen.